again and welcome to this next video. Now in this one we're going to look at the period from 1660 to 1666, the beginning of, of the persecution. Now we'll start from where we left off the last time, the restoration of Charles II. Charles II is restored to the throne uh, in 1660 and it really doesn't take him long before he starts to show his true colours and um, assert his authority on the church in Scotland, going against all that he had promised the Covenanters way back in 1651. And he starts off by, by going for the, the Covenanter leaders, and he's got a handful of men on the hit list in particular. Now the first of these was Archibald Campbell, the Duke of Argyll. He was the one who had placed the crown on the king's head at the coronation, um, of Charles II back at Schoon in 1651, when Charles II had, had actually signed the covenants. Now, Archibald Campbell goes to, 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 to London to present himself to the king. He assumes all is well. Charles II even agrees to have a, a meeting with him, but it's a trap and uh, he's arrested and held in the Tower of London. After a little while, he's transferred through to Edinburgh and put on trial for high treason. He is, is found guilty and he is sentenced to be beheaded on the Scottish guillotine known as the Maiden. And he would become the first of these uh, restoration martyrs, as they were known. As he went up the scaffold, some of his last words were, I wish the Lord to pardon him, I say no more, but God has laid engagements on Scotland. We are tied by covenants to religion and reformation. Those who were then unborn are yet engaged, and it passes the power of all the magistrates under heaven to absolve from the oath of God. A few days later, James Guthrie, who we spoke about in the last video, goes to the gallows in Edinburgh, saying, I take God to record in my soul, I would not exchange this scaffold with the palace or mitre of the greatest prelate in England. And his last words were, as I said in the last a video, the covenants, the covenants shall yet be Scotland's reviving. Archibald Johnson the, of Warriston, who was a lawyer of the National Covenant, he escapes, but he's hunted down, found in France and brought back and held in the Tower of London, again then being transferred up to, to Edinburgh to suffer the same fate uh, as James Guthrie on the gallows. From the scaffold, he, he reads his testimony, part of which was to just encourage God's people to continue praying and trusting God um, and just assuring them that, that, that God would, quote, return to his own truths, interests and servants, to revive his name, his covenant, his word, his work, his sanctuary and his saints in this nation. Yea, even in these three covenanted nations, which were by so solemn bonds, covenants, subscriptions and oaths given away and devoted to himself. Now, not everyone on the list would face death at the, at the hands of the hangman. Alexander Henderson, who was the, uh, the architect of, of the National Covenant, he certainly would have had he not died of natural causes in 1646. However, the King's anger at not being able to bring him to trial um, is evident even today. If you go to his grave in Edinburgh, you'll see musket ball holes and sword marks um, um, from the soldiers who were told to go down and destroy his grave at Greyfriars uh, Kirkyard in Edinburgh. Samuel Rutherford, who was the minister and professor at St Andrews, the author of Lex Rex or The Law and the Prince, again, he would certainly have been hanged had he not uh, died beforehand as well. He was gravely ill when he received his summons to stand trial for high treason. Knowing just how ill he was, uh, he turned to the messenger and told him to tell them that I have a superior judge, uh, I have a summons to appear before a superior judge. Now the death of these men was just going to be the beginning of 28 years of persecution for the Covenanters. Um, we also see at, the, at this time the, the, the work of returning the church to the state it was before the National Covenant was signed and um, begin with the, 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 the king making himself head of the church and the church being governed by bishops. At the start of 1661, a parliament is called in Edinburgh. And those who are chosen for the, this, this parliament are chosen carefully because of their known opposition to, to the covenants. 
it would later be called the, the, the Drunken Parliament. And this Drunken Parliament passes the Oath of Allegiance, in which people had to say that they recognised the king as having complete power over everything, even the church. In March, it passes the, the, the Recissory Act, which uh, abolishes all the acts of what the king called the pretend parliaments. These had been passed, um, the acts that had been passed since 1633. Now, many of these acts had been in favour of Reformation and Presbyterianism. So, with, with one uh, sweep, uh, all the work of the Second Reformation uh, is undone and the door is opened for episcopacy to be re-established in Scotland again. The next year, Parliament declares, declares that the, the covenants are unlawful and despite the fact he signed them himself, Charles II has them publicly burnt. A royal proclamation is made saying bishops are to be reintroduced to the Scottish Church with all their power and privileges restored. No general assemblies or meetings are to be held without the King's authority. And if you speak out or preach against uh, these changes, you, you will be subject to imprisonment. The King also decrees that every Presbyterian minister ordained since 1649 has to submit to the bishop or patron. However, many of these ministers, especially in the lowlands, refuse to submit. So the Earl of Middleton, who is Charles II's commissioner to the Parliament up in Scotland, decides to get tough with these ministers. The Privy Council meets in the hall uh, of the old Glasgow College on the 1st of October 1662 and issues a proclamation that all the ministers who have not submitted to their bishops are to remove themselves and their families out of their parishes by the 1st of November. Uh, and to lose their manses and their salaries. Soldiers would be used to enforce this um, by entering the churches and, and forcibly removing them if need be. Only one person on that Privy Council speaks out against it, and that was James Lockhart of Lee. In sad reality, uh, the reason he spoke out was he saw uh, how, how foolish it was, and also he was the only one there that was sober, which is why it became known as the Drunken Council. Now, they expected no more than 10 ministers were going to give up their livelihoods, but in reality, between three and 400 ministers chose to do just that, rather than go against their consciences. Uh, this was known as, as the Great Ejection. So on the last Sunday in October 1662, hundreds of ministers say farewell to their congregations amid scenes of sadness and grief and tears. The Reverend Alexander Peden, after closing the door of his church at, down at Glen Luce, he strikes the door three times with his Bible, saying, I arrest thee in my master's name, that none ever enter thee but such as come in through the door, as I have done. The, the, the Reverend John Welsh, who was the great-grandson of John Knox, and who was the minister at Iron Grey in Dumfries and Galloway, um, delays his, his leaving. So an order's issued for his arrest, but when the soldiers come to, um, come to arrest him, he's surrounded by his congregation and they escort him away from, from the church. Now the government and the bishops were left with a, a problem here. Now this drunken Privy Council had assumed that only a handful would leave their churches, but in reality they were left with hundreds of vacant churches and they all needed to be filled. So what were they going to do? Well to deal with this crisis, many young men from the Highlands are brought south and with very little training are ordained as curates. There's too many of them, uh, so many of them leaving uh, the Highlands that the, the farmers up there complained that having so few farm labourers due to them all getting jobs as ministers in the south. Now, these young Highlanders were ignorant of the lowlands uh, and the lowland ways and they were lacking both spiritually and morally. Bishop Burnett himself says that they were the dregs and refuse of the northern parts. They were the worst preachers I ever heard. They were ignorant to a reproach, and many of them were openly vicious. Needless to say, they were disliked by the congregations that they were forced upon, and many of them objected to their arrival. In fact, at Iron Grey, eh, the curate had to be escorted by soldiers, but even then, the women of Iron Grey attacked them with stones and beat them back. In this incident, the, the women would later face eh, public whipping, and the ringleader face banishment. 
the persecution, uh, the persecution of the covenanters, we can see, is starting to begin now, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, even when these curates get inside, their churches, their, their troubles never stopped, uh, didn't stop there. Quite often they would find the doors of the church barricaded by the people. The church bells to summon the people to worship wouldn't ring because people would take uh, remove the tongues of the bell. Uh, and quite often there was just no worshippers there at all. The whole situation was just becoming unworkable. Um, with hardly anybody going to these, these churches to hear these Episcopal ministers, Parliament passes an act or acts in 1663 that have become known as the Bishop's Dragnet. In these, the people who didn't go to their nearest church on Sundays would be fined um, large amounts of money, and that money being collected by the military. And those, those ministers who were ejected, who continued to preach, would also be punished. Husbands, they were responsible for making sure their wives were at church, or, or they would face punishment as well. However, th this didn't stop the Covenanters. The people still sought out their faithful preachers and, and would gather together uh, either in private homes or in barns or in the open air uh, in fields, um, at field services known as conventicles. Spies and informers would be employed to try and find these, these conventicles, these meetings. But despite this, they continued to grow and the size and numbers of them was really causing alarm for the Privy Council and the bishops. So in 1655, a royal pro uh, proclamation is issued forbidding these uh, conventicles. Your curates, most of them who were openly hostile to the people in their parishes, they would take lists of those not attending the churches, their churches, and pass them to the soldiers. These were known as blacklists. Um, the soldiers would then use fines, imprisonment, and even torture on those na whose names were on, on the lists, these blacklists. And these fines were not small um, amounts, they were huge amounts. Any poor farmer who couldn't uh, pay them would have the soldiers quartered on his farm and they would consume and spoil everything he had until he had nothing left. And hundreds of people were, were ruined in this way. Prisons were becoming overcrowded and torture was becoming common. Many of the people fled to the hills and moors just to seek safety and were now being declared rebels. With this persecution increasing, things were becoming unbearable and the people were just being pushed to the limit. And all this led the people in the southwest of Scotland to rise up in the first armed rebellion by the Covenanters. That rebellion would begin in the small hamlet of St John's town of Dorai in Dumfries and Galloway and would end uh, on the side of the Pertland Hills outside Edinburgh. And that's where we're going to pick up the next time. That's what we're going to look at in, in the next video. We'll see the, 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 the first armed rebellion. So thanks again for, for watching and uh, we hope to bring the next one to you again shortly. So thank you very much and take care.